really matters? That might be the most important question you can ask. So let's talk about it. Welcome to What Really Matters podcast, Everyday Spirituality with Karen Wyatt. And thanks, as always, for being here with me today, listening to another episode. I have been getting messages from some of you recently, letting me know that you really appreciate this podcast. And to be honest, I don't have that many listeners considering I've been doing this podcast for two years. But on the other hand, I also don't promote or market or even actually tell anyone about this podcast very often. So I guess those of you who have found it maybe have found it by accident or by word of mouth, or maybe you did see a little link to it on the website for End of Life University podcast. But no matter how you got here and no matter why you listen, I really really appreciate knowing that you're out there. Because in particular with this podcast, um, I, I feel very vulnerable as I'm sharing with you parts of my own journey, things that I'm struggling with, working on, learning about. And so that's that's a difficult thing to do week after week. And my rational mind, my lower consciousness, of course, and ego say to me, why are you doing this? Why are you telling people these things about yourself? Like, that's, that's ridiculous to expose yourself in this way. But it's my higher consciousness that says, you know, this is what we all need to do. We need to share what our journey is like. Because the more we come to understand one another, the more peace we will find in our society. And so before we can understand others, we really do have to understand ourselves. We have to know what motivates us, what our biases are, what our wounds are, so that we can see how they affect the way we think and the way we talk and the way we treat other people. So much of the work I do on myself is to also help me be a better person in the world, to help me treat other people better because I've rooted out some of the obstacles that are within me, the obstacles to loving and caring for others in the world. So that's why I talk about all these things and I make myself vulnerable. But just back to my original point, I just want to thank all of you who have shared with me that you find it helpful to listen. That's a little piece of information that helps me remember that there's value in doing this and helps me feel brave and strong enough to talk about the things that that I get inspired to discuss. So today, I'm going to talk about how to see beyond our own perspective. And in the past, I've done a lot of talking about kind of the integral model of consciousness development, the fact that as we reach higher and higher levels of consciousness, we are able to better see the world from more than one perspective. At lower consciousness, we look out at the world through this filter, this lens that has been created in our minds based on our past history, what society has taught us, what our parents have taught us, the traumas we've experienced, whatever pain we're carrying within us influences kind of the shape of the lens that we're looking at the world through. And we really are only able to see from that one perspective, the perspective of my inner wounded self looking out at the world and trying to interpret what's happening outside of me. But as we grow in consciousness, we become more and more able to connect with other people and to discover that other people don't see the world the same way we do. There are many different ways of looking at things that happen in the world, things that happen around us. And at first we feel threatened by those other perspectives and they all seem wrong to us. Like we have to change their minds. We have to show them how we see the world because we see it correctly. They're completely wrong. But again, as we grow in consciousness, we begin to see 
that each person is on their own path. Each person forges their own lens that they're looking at the world through. And there are reasons why they see the world the way they do. And gradually, we can develop more and more compassion for other people and understand where their perspective comes from, even if we don't agree with their perspective, and we may not agree with how they behave because of their perspective, we can at least still feel respect and value for those people. We can see them as part of our community, as connected to us as human beings. And we understand at some level how that perspective came about. So at lower consciousness, it's very threatening actually to learn about someone else's perspective because we don't want anything to shake our certainty that the way we see the world and what we believe and how we think is correct and true. So at lower levels of consciousness, we shut out other information. We don't want it to come in. We ban books. We shun people who think differently than we do. We group together with everyone who sees the world through a similar lens, and we condemn everyone who sees the world differently. But this is the perspective, this level of consciousness is what leads us into conflict and wars and hate crimes and polarization and division in our society. So it's really essential that we work on our own consciousness to help us grow and to help us be able to take more and more perspectives, even though there are many people in the world who do not and probably never will share our perspective. They will not look at the world the same way we do, and they may not understand us or have compassion for us. But we can't let that deter us. As we reach higher levels of consciousness, it becomes part of our responsibility, and it's part of our own spiritual path and spiritual growth to have empathy for the perspectives of other people, to see them and recognize where they come from. And so I, I want to tell you why I got on this, this topic today, because I had planned to talk about something else. But for the last couple of weeks, I've been reading a book. And this is the book that was the reading selection for my online reading group, A Year of Reading Dangerously. The book is The Good Death, An Exploration of Dying in America by Anne Newman. And so I've been reading this book, and Anne Newman kind of blew my mind because she told this amazing story. And Anne is a journalist whose father died. She cared for her father at the end of his life, and that's what inspired her to kind of go on this journey writing about death in America and interviewing people and exploring it. But one of the stories that Anne tells is that a, a number of years ago, as, as she was working up to to writing this book, she became interested in the death with dignity and medical aid in dying movement and started writing articles about it. She started posting things online, blogs online supportive of medical aid in dying and found that there was a whole group of people that were very negative and very outraged about what she was writing. And this group included um, people who were disability activists who themselves were disabled and were very vocal and very adamant that it, from their perspective, medical aid in dying is wrong. It's euthanasia in, in their eyes. And she writes that she had many back and forth exchanges, sometimes angry with people. She tried to explain her position. She could not understand where they were coming from. She tried to say, like, the fact that someone who's terminally ill wants to um, control when and how they die is has nothing to do with a disabled person like this it's not the same thing you're conflating things that don't belong together and she had a very hard time understanding 
their perspective and why they were so opposed to the idea of medical aid in dying. And this I'm paraphrasing her words from her book. But apparently one of the most vocal people who had um, argued with her online said, if you would ever like to have a face to face conversation, let me know and we can sit down together across the table and discuss this. And she decided that's a great idea. So she traveled to where he lived and she met with him, um, I think over coffee or over a meal. I, I, may, I may get some of the details wrong, but the essence of the story is this, that they had a really in-depth conversation and she found that he wasn't as angry or strident as she imagined he was from the things that he wrote online when she met him in person. He was actually reasonable and pleasant to talk to. And it turns out they actually, they met up more than that one time. And they stayed in communication with each other and actually became friends over time. And here's what she learned. And this was this is what blew my mind, because it's something that I hadn't thought of before. Again, like her, I was puzzled to understand why people in the disability movement um, are opposed to medical aid in dying for which I, which I saw as affecting other people, people dealing with a terminal illness who know they will die within a few months' time. And why is the disability movement so upset about these laws? I just could not make sense of it. But here's what part of what Anne Newman learned that was really powerful for me to learn. And one issue has to do with just the word dignity. And I have read this before that in surveys, some people say the reason they would want to end their life if they were terminally ill is because they don't want to lose their dignity. And the word dignity is equated with being able to care for your own hygiene as far as toileting is concerned. People don't want to wear a diaper and have someone else have to change that diaper for them and clean them. They don't want to reach that point and have to receive that type of care. And when many people talk about dignity, that's the aspect they're referring to. And yet what this man who um, has been in a wheelchair for most of his adult life talked about is the fact that many people with disabilities, that's the reality of their lives. They live with it every day, multiple times a day. They need help from someone else in terms of hygiene and caring for themselves. And to say that requiring that kind of help means there's no dignity and therefore life has no value is in a sense to say that people who live with a disability and need that kind of help have no dignity, their lives have no value. And that struck me because I had never thought of it from that perspective before. I had not imagined the perspective of someone who is in a wheelchair and unable to care for themselves on a daily basis for years and years and years of their life. And he also talked about the fact that every single day is a struggle to stay alive, to choose to be alive when you're living with a disability and suffering. For some people, it's a struggle every single day. And so the idea of making the choice to end life early is, is difficult for, for him to comprehend or imagine because he's so focused on trying to stay alive. Another issue is his greatest fear is that he will not receive the care he needs. His experience has been being overlooked by our society in general, um, by all the areas, all the parts of life that the rest of us enjoy that are not accessible to people in wheelchairs, and also being overlooked and undervalued by the medical profession, and that he lives with a fear 
that if he needs emergent care, he may not receive it because people in the medical profession may feel it's not worth it. His life doesn't have value. He doesn't have dignity. Therefore, you know, he's last on the list of people that would get care in an emergent situation. And again, I'm paraphrasing here, and I'm, I'm probably also adding thoughts of my own into what I read in the book. But all of this makes so much sense to me. And while there are many of us who are able-bodied and have been for our whole lives, and we're able to, to take care of ourselves uh, in every way. And the idea of losing any of our functions is anathema to us. And we can't imagine it. And we wouldn't, we think we would not want to live that way. Our greatest fear might be that someone will give us medical care that we don't want, that we will be in a situation where someone treats us, uh, gives us care extends or prolongs our life in a way that we do not want. And there is definitely a, a collective fear around that in certain populations. And that's one perspective of looking at how life ends at the end of life. And Anne Newman, I think, came from that perspective initially as well of, oh my gosh, like no one wants to be kept alive in these adverse circumstances. And yet, there's a whole population of people um, like this man that Anne met and became friends with who is struggling every day to make sure he gets the proper care he needs. And his greatest fear is being denied the care that might help him live a little bit longer. Um, his greatest fear is, is dying because no one would help him or care for him. And so if you think about it from that perspective, it all, it makes, it makes sense. I understand why the idea that we uh, in society would tolerate that it's okay for people to say that life no longer has value and isn't worth it. Um, you know, what is being missed is that these laws, the medical aid and dying laws, are very strict, and no one else makes a decision for another person about whether or not they are allowed to utilize that law. Uh, I mean, the doctors make, of course, doctors certify whether or not the person is qualified to make that decision, but no one else makes the decision for the patient or forces that decision on them. But I also understand why for someone who's been living with a disability their entire lives, it, this may seem like a slippery slope. And they fear being the people that will be discounted, that will be devalued. And so some of the really important questions here, I realize comes down to how we how we define certain words like dignity. What does dignity mean to each of us? And it's really important when we talk about that word that we understand how we think of it, but that we also understand that it may mean something else to other people. So if we go around saying everyone should have dignity at the end of life, I think we should define what we mean by that and what we are talking about when we use that word. I think of dignity as worth and value. Um, I don't relate it personally myself to uh, whether or not I need help with hygiene. For me, that's not connected, but I understand that, that it is for some people. And so it's important that we know how we're using the word and what it means. But what was also pointed out by Ann Newman in her book, that the quality of life means different things to different people as well. And again, we see, we see that term thrown around all the time, quality of life measures, improve your quality of life. We want people to have a good quality of life. And yet we may not have 
have a firm definition of what that means, or I may have my definition of what quality of life is, and it might mean something entirely different to another person. So if we're going to discuss it, and even if we're going to write articles, and we're going to put memes out on social media that use these terms, we need to understand and explain exactly what we're talking about. Exactly what when I say dignity or quality of life, this is what I mean by that. And explain our definitions of things so that it becomes clearer to other people what we mean. And I I see how so often some of our conflicts come because we simply don't understand the language we're using. We don't understand each other's definition of terms. So it's really essential that we're very clear in our language about what we mean. And another issue that Ann Newman brings up in her book is simply we may not even agree on what it means to be alive. And even science has had some questions about that. How do we determine if a person is no longer alive? And we use the term brain dead for someone whose heart is still beating, but their brain appears to have no function and have decided that that's equivalent to being dead, basically. But not everyone sees it that way. And not everyone agrees on that. And so this is a very basic issue to discuss between us, but also to have compassion and empathy that someone may see it differently than we see it. What I see for me, what I value for me, what I what I choose for me may be entirely different from what someone else chooses. And it's so important for empathy and compassion that we learn how to take other perspectives and how to see things the way other people are looking at them. And that is, again, it's part of our spiritual growth. It's part of our path to learn how to take other perspectives. And so I thought about some of the steps that are necessary to begin to take another person's perspective and that in the very beginning, we have to let go of our outrage over the fact that some people don't agree with us and don't see things the same way. We have to stop being angry and we have to stop defending our position so forcefully that we put down and shun and eliminate any disagreements with our perspective. So we have to tone it down. We have to control our emotions and kind of let go of being angry and imagine that's what it took Ann Newman to go visit this man who had argued with her in writing online to let go of her outrage and have a sense of equanimity about going to meet him and also a sense of just curiosity like, what is it? What makes you tick? What are, what are you about? I want to know more about who you are and your life. So I think letting go of outrage and having a healthy sense of curiosity about other people, that's a really important first step. And then the other thing that Ann Newman did is simply listen. And I think we need to go in with the intent to really hear what other people need to say more than we need to say how we feel. We need to listen to other people and learn from them and be willing to just hear their story. What are they about? Where did their ideas come from? How how did they form the lens that they're looking at the world through? What happened in their lives that formed it? And I think that's something really important that Anne Newman learned, and I learned as well by reading her story, about having this intimate, deep conversation with someone who's been in a wheelchair for most of his life and really coming to understand what life has been like for him. And I think it's essential that we take the attitude that we're there to receive the other person. If you know what I mean, we're so open that we are willing to let that other person come in to our conscious awareness we're willing to suspend in some ways our defensiveness and our ideas and attitudes about what's right or wrong 
and receive what this person needs to tell us. It, it doesn't mean that we need to suddenly shift our perspective on issues, only that we need to broaden our own perspective so that we can embrace additional perspectives and so that we're able to shift into a different perspective and see how or why someone else might feel the way they do about a particular topic. And I think part of that receiving of another person is beginning to understand their pain. What is hurting them? What, what has traumatized or hurt them throughout life that has shaped the lens they're looking at the world through? And what are they afraid of? And so if we can look at pain and fear, we can understand so much about what motivates another person and, and what's behind. Sometimes maybe they're their rage and anger and maybe even violence sometimes we might be able to understand that better i'm not saying that we condone uh, negative hurtful behavior but it may begin to make sense to us so that we don't need to be hateful or angry back toward another person who's who's behaving in that way so I think this is really essential for us, especially right now in our society. There's so much polarization. There's so much anger being expressed on all sides of every issue. It gets confusing. It gets overwhelming at times. But I think as we are working on our own consciousness and growth, it's really important that we be willing to expand and broaden our view and try to open up a little bit to some of the people who think differently than we do and come to some sort of an understanding of how and why did they get to the place where they see things this way. And maybe we won't need to condemn them anymore. Maybe we will be able to hold them in our hearts with compassion. And again, it doesn't mean that we change our perspective. We may still retain our beliefs exactly as they were before, but we have more room in our hearts now and in our minds to say, but I get it. I get why that person feels the way they do. And it's possible that we can find a way to express our perspective to that other person that helps them understand where we're coming from as well. And we might be able to bring about a little bit more peace in our relationships and overcome some of the negativity and the hostility that's happening. And ultimately, I think that we need to stop creating enemies of other people around us because, you know, we really are all one. We're all connected as human beings here on planet Earth. We're all here at the same time trying to live the best lives we can on this Earth. And if we can stop viewing other people as our sworn enemies and find some way to to have some acceptance for them. I think that brings about greater peace in our society, greater healing and creativity and growth and even opportunities to resolve some of the prob deep and serious problems we're facing right now with climate change. If we can work together, even though we have different perspectives, even though we see things differently and value different things. And so I wanted to bring this to a close with a quote I really like from Thich Nhat Hanh, who says, when you begin to see that your enemy is suffering, that is the beginning of insight. And so what I get from this quote, first of all, is that, uh, is, this, is this person really an enemy? And as soon as we see that someone else is suffering, are we able to still view them as an enemy if we saw them that way before? Or do we suddenly see them as having something in common with us? We see their pain, we see their fear. 
And Thich Nhat Hanh writes, it's the beginning of insight into ourselves if we can recognize the suffering in other people. It all works together. It's almost a catch-22 in a way. We have to be able to uh, to see the suffering of others to gain insight into ourselves. And we need more insight into ourselves in order to recognize the suf- suffering of others. But it all happens simultaneously. We're working on it together all the time. And so for me right now, I want to look at the people in my life that I sometimes clash with or have conflicts with, the people that just baffle me and I do not get I don't get how they think. I don't get how they could behave that way. I want to start opening my heart a little bit. I want to change some of my language. I want to make sure when I talk to them, I define what I mean by using certain terms and I want to understand what they mean. I want to tone down my emotions and my outrage. I want to listen first with an open heart I want to understand their pain and their fear because I believe that person will no longer be an enemy to me. I believe I will be able to see that person as a fellow traveler here on this journey, this very strange journey of life on planet earth. And the more, the more I let other people in, And the more perspectives I can take, the more chances we have to work together to make things better for everyone. And that's what I'm hoping for. So I don't know if this discussion is useful for you or not, but I wanted to share it with you because it's what's been on my mind for several days now. And, uh, Anne Newman's book, The Great Death, or The Good Death, and Exploration of Dying in America is is really a good book. I'm enjoying it a lot. So um, thanks for listening to all that I had to share with you today. And I'll see you next week back with whatever else is new on my mind. And until then, remember that we're here for love. At least that's how I see it. We're really here for love. So face your fear. Be ready for whatever life may bring you next. And just love each and every moment of your precious existence here on this planet. Bye-bye.